Hello, and welcome to another Learning in 10 review. My name is Michael Boniface, and I am a resident physician in emergency medicine at Duke University Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. Today, we are going to learn about carbon monoxide poisoning. Here are the learning objectives for today's presentation. At the end of the review, I would like you to recognize the clinical presentation and mechanisms of carbon monoxide poisoning, identify the physiological mechanisms by which carbon monoxide causes disease, appreciate the approach to initial stabilization and evaluation of a carbon monoxide victim, and discuss advanced therapeutics like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'd like to start out this Learning in 10 review with several clinical cases. First, consider a mother who brings her 7-year-old girl and 5-year-old son to the emergency room in the rural Midwest in January with a chief complaint of a viral illness. The children's mother explains that they are both complaining of upset stomach, nausea, and headache. The mother admits that she also feels unwell and thinks they may have given her a virus. Second, think of a 65-year-old man found asleep in his car with the engine running. He is breathing spontaneously and has a pulse but does not respond to commands. Or, the 33-year-old warehouse worker presenting to the ER with vague complaints of difficulty concentrating, dizziness, and a mild progressive headache throughout the day. Finally, a 40-year-old woman brought to the ER by ambulance into the resuscitation bay after sustaining second and third degree burns to 25% of her total body surface area after she was trapped in her burning mobile home for approximately 15 minutes before rescue. All of these cases, while widely varied and different presenting complaints, represent carbon monoxide poisoning. In the case of the family, a common cause of carbon monoxide poisoning is the use of gasoline generators or combustion heaters in the winter used in close proximity to living quarters or with poor ventilation. Be very suspicious of carbon monoxide in colder months, especially when multiple members of the same family present with similar symptoms. Next, the 65-year-old man. Automobile exhaust is the number one mechanism of carbon monoxide poisoning in the United States, and most deaths from carbon monoxide poisoning are due to suicide attempt. Also, the 33-year-old warehouse worker was later found to be operating a forklift in a poorly ventilated warehouse. These industrial forklifts are powered by propane combustion, and he was diagnosed with carbon monoxide poisoning. Police were then dispatched to his place of work to assure the safety of his co-workers, who presumably were all also exposed. Finally, the smoke inhalation victim. Carbon monoxide, along with cyanide and other noxious gases, is of utmost importance to recognize in any smoke inhalation victim. Every year in the United States, roughly 40,000 patients present to the emergency room with carbon monoxide poisoning. While 25,000, most of these are related to structure fires and smoke inhalation, 15,000 are non-fire related. Please also have an appreciation that these figures may be significantly underestimated, as many cases of carbon monoxide poisoning go unrecognized and are attributed to other diseases. So where does carbon monoxide come from? Well, carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas produced from the combustion of carbon-containing compounds. Common sources include internal combustion engines found in automobiles and portable generators. Other sources include natural gas-based heating systems, camping stoves, or lanterns. A significant amount of carbon monoxide is produced in structure fires, in addition to other noxious gases. Interestingly, our bodies can produce carbon monoxide in vivo when our liver converts methylene chloride, also known as dichloromethane, to carbon monoxide. This compound, methylene chloride, is a common industrial solvent, most often found in paint stripping compounds. The clinical presentation of carbon monoxide poisoning is very broad and nonspecific, ranging from headache, nausea, vomiting, and confusion to stupor and coma. The severity of the symptoms is associated with the exposure to carbon monoxide and the levels of carboxyhemoglobin in a patient's blood. At moderate levels of intoxication, patients can complain of syncope, dyspnea, or angina, and at critical exposures, seizures, coma, hypotension, dysrhythmias, or death may occur. Have a high suspicion for these nonspecific symptoms, especially in the winter months or in high-risk populations. 
To better understand the pathophysiology of carbon monoxide poisoning, please take a moment to appreciate the structure of the molecules shown at the right. The bottom is a hemoglobin molecule containing four iron-containing heme groups. The heme group shown above is an iron-containing molecule in the center of a large heterocyclic organic ring called a porphyrin. There are four of these heme groups in a hemoglobin molecule, and each is available to bind either oxygen or carbon monoxide. In the case of carbon monoxide exposure, the gas rapidly diffuses across the alveolar membrane to bind with the iron moiety of the heme group with an affinity 240 times greater than that of oxygen. This creates a carboxyhemoglobin molecule, causing a conformational change in the hemoglobin rather than oxyhemoglobin. Concentrations of carboxyhemoglobin in the blood depend on atmospheric concentrations of oxygen and carbon monoxide, as well as time exposed and the patient's minute ventilation. The presence of carbon monoxide and binding to these heme groups greatly reduces the total number of available hemoglobin molecules which oxygen can bind to. The total amount of oxygen available in our blood is the sum of both dissolved oxygen and hemoglobin-bound oxygen, as represented by the equation on the right. While carbon monoxide does not affect the amount of dissolved oxygen, that only represents 2% of the total oxygen content. Most of the oxygen available in our blood is bound to hemoglobin. Reducing the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin, or the ability of hemoglobin to offload oxygen to the peripheral tissues, systemic tissue hypoxemia and ischemia result. Peripheral tissues and cells are forced into anaerobic metabolism, causing a lactic acidosis. In addition to the hypoxia-ischemia-acidosis mechanism, carbon monoxide has several other factors which make it poisonous. It may bind to cytochrome oxidase itself of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, much like cyanide, and force tissues into anaerobic metabolism. Patients are also prone to reperfusion injury when removed from an environment and therapy initiated with oxygen. Carbon monoxide may also stimulate neutrophilic release of inflammatory mediators, reactive oxygen species, and cause oxidative stress in vascular lining. The most severe morbidity in patients who survive carbon monoxide poisoning are the delayed and persistent neurological sequelae. As many as 30 to 40 percent of patients will have symptoms including memory disturbances, personality change, or other neurocognitive disturbances. Often, these are permanent and non-reversible. Here is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Carbon monoxide is one factor which may shift this curve leftward. A leftward shift in this curve causes hemoglobin to have a greater affinity for oxygen and hold on to it making it harder to offload its oxygen to peripheral tissues. This is caused by a conformational change in the hemoglobin molecule as carbon monoxide occupies at least one of the four available heme sites. Have a high clinical suspicion based on the history and presenting symptoms, as many minor cases are often missed. Please be aware that standard pulse oximetry is often normal because it cannot distinguish between carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. Advanced pulse co-oximeters capable of measuring carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin have been developed but are not yet in widespread use. An arterial blood gas will also reveal a normal partial pressure of oxygen because carbon monoxide does not affect the total amount of dissolved oxygen in blood. However, this is only normally 2% of the total oxygen content. This being said, oxygen-bound hemoglobin is greatly reduced. An arterial blood gas often can also measure carboxyhemoglobin percent directly. A metabolic acidosis is usually observed. And then consider additional testing such as an electrocardiogram, neuroimaging to rule out alternative etiologies, and cyanide levels for smoke inhalation victims. The first step in the management of a carbon monoxide victim is removing them from the environment from which they were exposed. Next. Basic life support principles such as airway, breathing, and circulation should be employed. The definitive therapy for carbon monoxide poisoning is oxygen. Please review the table below and appreciate that the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin is greatly affected by the FiO2 of oxygen that a victim is inhaling. If left to breathe room air at sea level, thus an FiO2 of 21%, 
it will take four to six hours for half of the carboxyhemoglobin to wash out. This can be reduced to 90 minutes in the case of 100% by face mask, 75 minutes by endotracheal intubation, or if you use hyperbaric oxygen, which is 100% FiO2 at 2.5 atmospheric pressures, the half-life can be reduced to 20 minutes. For high-risk or severely poisoned patients, hyperbaric oxygen therapy may be the preferred treatment modality. As shown in the previous table, hyperbaric oxygen greatly reduces the elimination half-life of carboxyhemoglobin to as little as 20 minutes when treated at 2.5 atmospheres. In addition, you can increase the total blood dissolved oxygen content. And while studies are still controversial, this may decrease the delayed and persistent neurological sequelae. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is currently recommended for any patient over the age of 50, patients with a metabolic acidosis, history of loss of consciousness, pregnancy, or any carboxyhemoglobin level greater than 25%. In summary, carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas that forms primarily as a byproduct of combustion. The molecule binds to hemoglobin with an affinity 240 times that of oxygen. This decreases the total available binding sites for oxygen, causing a left shift in the oxygen-hemoglobin dissociation curve. The clinical presentation is very nonspecific, and standard pulse oximetry may be normal. Treat patients with decontamination and oxygen therapy, and in severe cases, consider hyperbaric oxygen. Thank you. This has been another Learning in 10 review.